So thank you, Jim. One of the things that's, that's been fun over the years of, of getting to know Jim is that he's uh, also found a, a great way to get his team to understand the importance of integrating uh, this consistency in the business model across all of the product lines. And um, I can tell you that before Jim was there, while Red Hat was a great company, it was a $400 million company. It wasn't a billion and a half uh, company. And, and that scalability that we talked about earlier on in a business model is something that you've really brought to bear. So let's talk a little bit about that. Scaling the business model versus we were trying to do a bunch of different stuff exactly. that were unrelated. Exactly. Always so, a mistake. So let's talk a little bit about that. How did you get that scalability into the business? Because it's, it's not easy to, to add a billion dollars worth of revenue. Uh, in six years, and you've done that, and you've done it with a business model that, as you say, is, is pretty complex. What did you do to make things repeatable, more scalable, and, and obviously therefore build a value? Well, I, mean, I think there are a, a, a couple things. When we, one was, it was clear that we had developed the kind of the core of a business model that was, that looked like it could be successful, but you're right, it was relatively small. We were a single digit share of the operating system business. Right. And I guess for starters, we, you know, my observation was we were, we were doing about 10 other things, and I'm sitting here looking saying, wait a minute, we're like the Kleenex brand of Linux, right? I mean, you know, we're the best known brand. We're single digit share of all server operating systems. Who cares if we're high share of Linux? Right. You know, we think about the, the problem is our server operating system, we're single digit share. Frankly, why the hell would I do anything else but work on reaching the full potential of that business? So right. first is defining the market. And so we just bought JBoss. I want to say we put it on life support, but we basically said, look, we got to reach the full potential of Linux. Let's put JBoss a bit on life support for a couple of years till we had kind of really driven and gotten to where we want there and stopped doing everything else, which is basically what we did. And I guess the general observation then is you say, well, how do I scale the model in the sense of I have this great value proposition for customers based on open source and this enterprise model that's somewhat unique. And the general observation, and this is, you know, I think what a lot of customers face today, or a lot of, of smaller companies face is, I have a great business model that I think has great value, but how come customers aren't buying it? I remember my first month, we were having a meeting of um, my senior executive team, and I was asking about win rates. And I remember Guy Werner Knoblik, who still runs uh, Europe for us, uh, said, we win 80% of the bids that we're involved in. So we win 80% of the bids we're involved in, and we have about 5% share. <laughs> so what's wrong here, right? And this is, obviously we had a scalability problem. And so then you say, well, why, do we have a, why aren't we involved in more things? And what you start to recognize is, believe it or not, very few people, in our case, buy technology based on the merits of the technology, right? right? You're business. buying a business solution that includes the technology. And you then say, okay, and I went out and talked to a lot of CIOs, you know, talking to customers. It's amazing. Customers will actually tell you what they want. It's amazing. I don't know why more <laughs> Scary people thought. do it. Yeah. So, and what you would hear is, well, I source solutions, and those are from the in, in software providers. So, you know, an application software provider or a systems integrator or a value added reseller, depending on what it is. And I can't hold them accountable to, for the in solution if I'm telling them what to put in it. And I remember, I was actually in Paris, and I had the CIO of Societe Generale. We'd have a lot of wine at this point. And I had a bunch, he finally just, he said, wait a minute. When I was going through the spiel, he said, this is great, but you shouldn't be having dinner with me. You should have dinner with my systems integrators. I love the story, I'd love for them to put it in, in, in the solutions they're providing me, but they're the ones who make those decisions. That's exactly right. And so one of the key things we did is we said, look, we were primarily a direct business. Yep. And the early adopters, again, the stock exchanges, the banks, the telcos, really wanted a direct relationship with Red Hat, and they really want to talk about the technology, and they were technologists. But let me tell you, places where I come from, like Delta Airlines, you know, not hiring the A-plus computer scientists to work there, right? We didn't really <laughs> focus on technology for competitive advantage. So those companies were sourcing from vendors. Yep. And so we needed those vendors to sell our products. So even though the value proposition was still designed for the end customer, we spent a lot of time really blowing out channels, strategic relationship with systems integrators, ISVs. And the pitch was simple. You go to a systems integrator and say, we can make your whole solution cost you know, 30% less. Whether you're going to pass that on to your end customer or not, that's up to you. But we can make the solution cost a lot less. Well, that's an interesting story for them. So we kind of had to pitch the value of the solution to, again, integrators, SIs, et cetera, et cetera, and then they actually can go out and help drive our products. So I think the biggest thing that we were able to do is 
Again, companies like Delta Airlines, why would they ever want to meet with the people making their operating systems or middleware? The CIO certainly would never want to, but they want to talk to the people doing their crew scheduling system. The crew scheduling system, people will say, hey, you know, run it on Red Hat, then it's going to be on Red Hat. So it's really recognizing that even the value proposition was the end customer, the route to get there was crafting a, a value proposition for the others in the channel. And I think it's really, dro uh, r really got a scale is as soon as we got channel partners to be out there pushing our stack. Well, it's fun listening to you because you could probably be in about three of our classes and, and contribute to every one of them. So we'll just, I'll take apart a couple of those things for, for the students so that they can kind of piece them together. First of all, I mean, you, obviously what you did there is you, you stepped back and said, like, within, within your value proposition, you're a piece of the value chain. And who could you obviously work with who would complement that and complement you? And that was your systems integrators. And of course, that opens up your distribution channel. That gives you a multiplier and you go to market. And that establishes a basis for much broader reach. And that obviously gives you the best ability to get higher repeatability. And so a number of these terms we talk about in the classes in both go to market, value prop, et cetera. And, and, I, and I would also make sure to break out who are your kind of people who help you make the market in yep. terms of help you do the transaction versus who are the real influencers. Like for us. Well said. You know, the, the OEM partners who, in, uh, who embed or, or install RHEL preloaded on, on servers, you know, they're good partners and, and they do influence a little bit of business, but only a little bit, yeah. right? That's often a delivery vehicle. So people will take delivery of the product on a server coming from, you know, Dell or HP or IBM. But, the, but they're not necessarily the ones driving that decision. So you gotta be real careful with your partners. So they're important partners because they're very important distribution partners. Yeah, fulfillment versus influence. Fulfillment infants. versus truly helping us drive yeah. the, the business. And so thinking hard about those partners, and you kind of need to have both. Yeah, but recognizing absolutely. just being big doesn't necessarily mean they're the ones who are gonna help you drive the business. No, that's well. very well said. Well, now let's go back a little bit in your business model because one of the things that we get asked a lot um, when certainly when we're talking about open source in the class is, you know, so, okay, um, you, you mentioned defensibility, but why can't somebody just recreate, you know, a project and go and now copy the formula that you've got? And, uh, and by the way, defensibility is a very important part of the three Ds that we talk about in value proposition. So I couldn't agree with you more. It's super important to, to emphasize. But I think you started to talk about something very important without underlying a word that, that I always use, and I want to check that it's the right one, which is the certification is critical. Because in the end, you know, you've got to do the upstream influence, as you said, um, and you've got to be able to obviously make sure that these, these products um, you know, are meeting business needs. But if you don't certify in the middle, everything falls apart. So uh, you talked about it, but tell us a little bit about how critical is that in the business model for open source? Oh, well, it ends up being critical, critical, critical. Because you know, I, I, I couched a lot of the, the value of the business model to the end customer around stability. But you can imagine that is as critical, if not more critical, for the other vendors you know, uh, in, in the equation. So if you're SAP, you know, if you deliver an ERP system and it goes down, um, you know, even if it was because of the hardware or because of the operating system or the Your middleware, problem. customer doesn't give a crap. The yeah. ERP system went down and it was sold by SAP. So they really truly see value in the, 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 that certification process uh, as well. So there's value for them there, but it also, again, that, there is a network effect in our business. I mean, one of the reasons we have, whatever it is, 75, 80% share, especially on the Linux side, this year is because we had 75 or 80% share last year, and everybody certifies to it because everybody runs it, and everybody runs it because everybody's certified to it. So that, getting that network effect started is really, really critical. And you know, one of the reasons that uh, uh, we delivered OpenStack the way we did is the Red Hat Linux OpenStack platform is it's, it, it, OpenStack requires a hypervisor and an operating system. Right. We didn't want to have to go rebuild the ecosystem, right? So applications certify against an operating system. Hardware certifies against either a hypervisor or an operating system, depending on your deployment model. So when we looked at OpenStack, it's like, we don't want to have OpenStack that could run on any hypervisor operating system, not that we would care if it's run on others, but in terms of us bringing something to market, a core source of value is, as soon as it's the Red Hat Linux OpenStack platform, you know, it, with our hypervisor in there, every piece of hardware is already certified to it. And virtually every major application is certified to run. If you're running it on that, you'll get support, right? So extending, as we think about, you know, yeah, we're the large contributor upstream and all the other things we do in the business model, we're also extending our certified ecosystem into OpenStack, Absolutely. right? And so we look hard at doing that and recognize that's a core, core, core source of value 
in, in the defensibility of the model. Good. Well, it would have been awkward if you'd said, oh, it's irrelevant, because I've been preaching <laughs> that for rather a long time. Uh, so let's talk a little bit about this balance that you have, because you, I think, articulated beautifully the importance of being able to provide this real f foundational stability for your customers that they can rely on. They can run their business on it. You set out a life cycle. You give them a roadmap. You give them that confidence, and you worry about the rest. They see that as the value to obviously continue to run their products or services on. Now, that's something that's completely the opposite extreme of what you talked about on the other side of the uh, introduction, which is innovation. And obviously, the pace of innovation is hugely determined by the community. I mean, it's, it's almost 100% determined by the community. Right. And in some cases, you know, people want to innovate you know, at the speed of weeks, days, even hours in some instances. You mentioned examples that we see, like uh, some of these social media companies. How do you balance that? How do you balance the need for innovation with the obvious need to provide? You know? It is really, really, really hard. Because so, and you know, the problem is when you say a customer too, the dev shops want everything yesterday that isn't even fully out in the market yet. They'll take beta stuff. The production side of the shop wants stuff that's been running for at least 10 years, right? Yeah, you know, take yeah, the extremes. Yeah. And so how you put those things together, it, it's a balancing act. So first off, depending on feature velocity, we have different uh, cadences for our product. So for like RHEL, every three years for a major release, OpenStack every six months. But then even within that, you know, one of the big pushbacks we've gotten, and so we're experimenting with some things on the margin, now let me go back to Linux on this one, is when we ship Linux, we have a relatively slow cadence of updating, you know, compilers, interpreters, all, you know, the, the, the uh, application kind of language frameworks, et cetera, that go along with it. And the reason we do that is because production doesn't want to have too many versions of Ruby running in their infrastructure. Of course, the developers want the latest and greatest. So how you balance those two things, we've probably gone too far to the production side where we were, you know, really only refreshing about every year some of those things. So we now have a kind of a new pack and companies can now decide, do you want to have our faster cadence of languages, tooling mm -hmm. updates, mm -hmm. you know, and we'll make sure it runs on the same kernel or do you not? And so we're trying to leave it a little bit up to customers because again, you get developers saying, well, the Red Hat stuff's moving too slow. You get the production people saying it's running too fast. And so we're trying to tease those things out. There is no right answer uh, against those things. So we, um, you know, we're trying to thread the needle depending on the product. And it's, uh, those are daily type decisions about, you know, what, you know, when, when are we going to ship the Ruby 2.0, uh, um, you know, uh, language packs uh, in RHEL. You know, the developers want it, but the production people say, well, I've already got Not seven any. flavors running yeah. for different applications. I don't want more. Yeah. Um, on a more broad sense, you know, that, that, again, that's a big piece of when and the how value. we run our cadence, yeah. right? We also, I should say, you know, we say we run our cadence when we say we freeze the spec, it doesn't mean we don't try to add things. One of the nice parts about our model, uh, I would argue in general the nice part about open source is um, the subscription model, we're not driven by major releases in terms of driving revenue, yeah. right? And the nice part about that is we therefore don't try to bundle up a lot of features when we, to come out with a new version. You're gonna keep shipping them continuously. Right, so, so you know, our major, major mega change in virtualization, we decided to go from Zen to KVM, we thought it was a better technology. You know, it first came out in RHEL 5.4. Well, why wasn't that in a new release? Well, we don't care. You know, when we ship, and I get asked by analysts all, this all the time, so oh, when you come out with a new version of RHEL, what's your revenue uplift? Sometimes it's zero. It's a if you're a subscriber to RHEL, you get RHEL, and you can choose whatever version you want. And part of the value is people don't have to upgrade to a new version if they don't need it. And it's the continuous the adoption, effectively. So we do try to, as much innovation as we can pump in without breaking binary compatibility, mm -hmm. we pump into the sub-releases. Um, the key is to not break binary compatibility, right. because that's when customers, customers have to do yeah. application reintegration. Yeah. And we do that across the product portfolio. So in essence, I hear you saying that what you're really balancing is that customer's ability to adopt this, to consume it, if you will, in a digestible form, and keep operating their business without disruption. Right, because that's the core value we provide, yeah. is that yeah. stability, lack of disruption. Yeah, and, and that's actually a, a key part of what I'd point out for, for people who are trying to establish, you know, what do you build in the way of the value around this business model? That's not an easy thing to do, and you, you just described why. Uh, and that becomes a part of the defensibility of the business model, is your ability to manage that 
as in the way that you've done. Well, and this happens, I think, for a ton of companies is, you know, who's the buyer versus who's the user of your product? Right. And if you start really too much focusing on either one, you kind of get it wrong. So you focus too much on the user, then the buyer says, eh, this doesn't meet this set of needs. You focus too much on the buyer, the users who have to tell the buyer to buy it say, yeah, I don't want that, right? Yeah. And I think this is one of the big issues with innovation is CIOs have really horrible jobs, right? I mean, it's really, you are held to standards around security and reliability, you know, et cetera, et cetera, yet the expectation levels set by these Web 2.0 companies, I always talk about those, those last two nines are important. And what I mean, they're saying 99.9% .9 reliability, they're saying 99.999 reliability, these last two nines is huge. And so CIOs are kind of stuck, and so they're looking for greater levels of security, stability, slower cadence than the users want. And so it's not just us that has to think about, it's anybody selling into enterprise technology, and I'm sure other areas as well, thinking about recognizing there are different people with different needs and don't overly focus on one to the other. You gotta kind of balance it all. That's well said. So for those of you who will be in the class in the spring, we talk about this and in the DMU as we call it, the decision making unit and who has what role and how do you have to actually work with all of them to actually make sure that you're meeting their needs. Well, just because I'm, I'm uh, conscious that we should give time for our panel and people have a break in between, I'm gonna ask the last couple of questions to just take an orthogonal path. So, so first of all, uh, you, know, you are somebody who's obviously taken this culture at Red Hat very seriously, and I've observed it you know, working with you over the years, and it's been a pleasure to watch from the outside. But what would you describe as Red Hat's culture? You mentioned it was incredibly important. It was great to hear you say that. I, we have actually, I think, taken the core principles around open source and we said, all right, the way that open source is able to organize disparate people in projects and bring together great software, we've tried to apply it to running a company. So That's it great. is this difficult in many ways, uh, but, but phenomenal meritocracy. I mean, a couple of examples. So I remember my first month at, uh, at Red Hat, I, I sit down and we're going through a review around you know, what we're gonna do in virtualization. At the time, Red Hat was a big supporter of Zen. And so I have the guy who runs all the products and engineering, Paul. so reports to me, Paul. Yep. Brian Stevens, who works for yep. him, who runs engineering. The guy kind of below him that ran kind of virtualization engineering, mm -hmm. and a couple of, of, uh, of, of people then within that organization. So one of the core developers, got Uli Drepper, so he's like five levels down. We're talking about this, we're talking about our go-to-market around Zen, just said, yeah, and we're doing this, but you know, it's really, it's the wrong technology. We really kind of made a dumb choice there, and we really should have done this. You know, so I come from the airline industry, which is about as military as you get. Literally, when I would drive in, because I had a sticker on my car that I was an officer, they would salute as, you know, the security guards when you drove in, right? <laughs> I the forgot idea. to do that when you came in today. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I didn't get my salute, huh? We'll work on so. that. <laughs> I get a different kind of salute a lot of times from our engineers. <laughs> and, yeah. um, the, uh, but literally, the idea that somebody six levels down in the organization in front of his boss, his boss, his boss, his boss, his boss, his boss, in front of the CEO would just matter-of-factly say, all of my superiors up above me, they really made a stupid decision, and we ultimately should have done something completely different. And I'm sitting here listening to this guy, which is fine, but I'm wondering, none of the other people in that chain of command were getting upset. Yeah. Like, you know, that's his opinion. We went a different way, but that's fine. It's the nature of the organization. That's why communities of, work, too. Yeah, exactly. It's, you're allowed to say whatever you want. Yeah. And uh, the best ideas ultimately win. By the way, we ended up buying Kumernet because he was right. We should right. have been on KBM. Right, exactly. So he turned out to be right, and it cost us a hundred and some million dollars when we did that. But um, it's ultimately probably put you in a much better position. Oh, absolutely. Much better but, technology. But that's itself. a very kind of normal thing that happens. That's a great so example. The simple example I'd say is, you know, there are consulting firms built on doing change management, mm -hmm. right? You know, executives make a decision. How do you get your company to change to do it? We have zero change management at Red Hat. It is a royal pain in the ass, sorry, excuse my French, to get a decision made at Red Hat because Everybody wants to weigh in, and if we make a decision in the dark and announce it, people get really upset. So we really work hard to engage people in making decisions. So it takes a long time for us to make a decision, but after we made a decision, 
we actually execute relatively well because there's zero change management. We've kind of just moved what is the traditional change management process that happens after executives have made a decision, and we've moved it into getting everybody involved in the decisions. And so by the time you've made the decision, people are on board. Even if they don't agree with it, they're on board for why you made it, and execution actually happens well. So it's a different way to run something. I would argue it's much more efficient. And the only other thing I would say around that, we call it collaboration at times. You know, a lot of people think of, you know, participative, collaborative as everybody holding hands and singing kumbaya. It's actually pretty harsh. There's actually been some interesting studies lately saying that the concept of brainstorming that was developed in the 50s doesn't work. That telling everybody, ooh, that was a good idea and let's list them all. Actually, you get much better solutions when you say, you know, that was the dumbest idea I've ever heard. We're not putting that one up there. This one. <laughs> and actually having frank conversations. Absolutely. Versus being, so Red Hat isn't necessarily a nice place. I mean, that's a fun-loving place, but, you know, you have to have a thick skin because people, if People don't like your idea, they don't say, oh, that's interesting. They <laughs> tell you it was a lousy idea, so. Well, the great news it's about that is. It's open source community. Yeah, right? exactly. So, but what I love hearing about here is that you've effectively taken open source as a business model and you've also made it your culture, too. Yeah. And, and, you know, I'm very fond of saying this, which is, you know, great consensus builds great conviction, too. So you're expressly saying that in terms of people getting behind these decisions. Well, it's been a pleasure. Great to get you up here. I think we should take a break here and then uh, get our panel up. And uh, thanks again for coming in and sharing so openly with us, you know, what it is that's driven Red Hat. Congratulations. I'm sure it's just the beginning. So here's the lots more of it. Thank you. Thanks again. Appreciate it.